Live and Let Die, the eighth movie in the Bond series. Funny enough, now my favorite Bond movie. The first Bond film that I reviewed, Dr. No, was my favorite. However, Live and Let Die has now uh, astoundingly uh, taken my favorite spot for many reasons. Live and Let Die takes place in three locales, uh, one urban and uh, two tropical. Uh, first of all, my favorite locales are tropical, one of the reasons why Dr. No was one of my favorite movies. First, the movie is connected by three deaths. Uh, the first takes place in New York at the UN. Uh, later in New York, uh, Harlem is used. It's one of my favorite locales because it's urban, it has uh, soul, it, it represents the times, black power, everything that was going on around there. Uh, the second locale, another agent dies. He dies in New Orleans. Um, I like New Orleans with the voodoo Creole feel, feel to it. You know, that uh, more of that black soul feeling. I, I really like this locale. And the third is uh, San Monique. It's a tropical island in the Caribbean. And this also has a, a very ethnic... Um, feel to it. I really like that uh, about San Monique, especially because uh, they have the tropical, they have the indigenous people, the natives, they have their rituals, the voodoo. Uh, it really just brings out the essence of everything this movie is about. The villain in this movie is just fantastic, Dr. Kananga. He is one of my favorite, well, no, let me scratch that. He's my favorite Bond villain. All right, and for many reasons, uh, which I'll go into later. But the main plot of this movie is that Dr. Kananga, who pretty much runs the island of San Monique, has a uh, heroin operation going on, growing poppy fields. His plan is to take the poppy fields uh, and the heroin operation and completely distribute all the heroin for free to the United States, after which he gets everyone hooked then he jacks up the prices and makes tons of money. Th this, is, this is a phenomenally smart idea. Uh, uh, I'll finish later, but the, the main point is, this is his main plot, it's a fantastic one, and this is the main driving force in Live and Let Die. So, Dr. Kananga, um, interestingly enough, actually plays two roles in Live and Let Die. He plays himself, uh, the ran the guy who runs uh, San Monique, in addition to um, this criminal mastermind of this heroin operation. However, he also plays a character named Mr. Big, who runs uh, pretty much the entire United States operation based out of Harlem. This guy has everyone working for him. The cab driver, like the shoe shine guy. Uh, also, in addition to that, this bar he has, everyone is an informant at this bar in which James Bond, he takes a step into later on in the movie. Mr. Big's alerted of James Bond's presence the instant he even gets into New York. So, uh, needless to say, Dr. Kananga, a.k.a. Mr. Big, has his claws everywhere in, in, in this operation. One reason I really like Dr. Kananga is because, unlike a lot of the uh, his fellow Bond villains, he actually tries to kill James Bond right off the bat. Uh, as the character he portrays Mr. Big, when James Bond shows up and is caught in Harlem, he tells his henchmen right off the bat, kill this sucker, you know? Uh, he doesn't want to deal with him. He's smart. Uh, unlike these other Bond villains, he knows that Bond's not anyone to trifle with. He just wants him out of his hair and taken care of as soon as possible. I really like that. My favorite part of the movie is when Kananga, Solitaire, a character I'll talk about in a second, and James Bond end up all meeting at the end in Kananga's secret underground lair. After having executed an, an excellent plan, James Bond pretty much obliterates Kananga's poppy fields, or so he thinks, just to end up meeting up with Kananga and Kananga to laugh off. Oh, those poppy fields, I assure you, they'll be quite fine. Uh, it's like he's not even worried about it. James Bond's master plan didn't even work. 
Uh, he's like a true supervillain. He's not even phased by James Bond's smallest attempt at, at, at undermining him. Finally, about Dr. Kananga, and, and I gotta say, this has to be, in any of the Bond movies I've seen, the best death scene. But, uh, you know, because usually with the villains, usually they, they blow up in some building explosion, so you never really get to see them die. In this, James Bond ends up taking an exploding capsule which, which inflates uh, anything it uh, detonates within, fill it with air. Dr. Kananga actually swallows this, gets filled with air, floats to the top of the roof, and ends up exploding, bursting into millions of pieces. Quite comically, it's beautiful, though, because not only is it comical, it's done perfect, it's done well, and you know what? That's the best they had for those times. So I give this scene a lot of respect. All right, let me break it down a second for you. So, Solitaire. She's the main Bond girl in this film. Hell, she's the only Bond girl in this film, if you ask me. The other Bond girl featured, Rosie, she, she was a great actress. She played a good part. However, I just wasn't convinced that she really had any defining role as a Bond girl in the sense that she didn't have any confidence, and she was scared and inept the entire time. But solitaire is what really rings true for the Bond girl in this film. First of all, solitaire, played by Jane Seymour, uh, one of our uh, late and great favorites from Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. Uh, she is such a great Bond girl to me because she actually had her character develop. She was solitaire before she was the Bond girl. Unlike many of these Bond girls that are the Bond girl first and foremost, and then their character gets developed. We cared about solitaire. We were interested in what was going on. And we were quite intrigued with her magical foretelling powers with the use of tarot. This also is another driving force throughout the movie. I like this theme and the entire voodoo... Uh, feel we got from it. So I really like how Solitaire is her own character before she's even a Bond girl. She is a rival, a, a compliment for James Bond, not just a tag along. Very similar to my last review, I'm going to talk a lot about the characters in this review, as I already have. Uh, some minor character characters that I'd really like to talk about is... Uh, First and foremost, Baron Samedi. This guy is some hoodoo, voodoo priest uh, on the island of San Monique who helps out Dr. Kananga through whatever mutual interest I can't quite figure out throughout this movie. Basically, he just likes being mischievous. Uh, he eludes James Bond. He gets shot by James Bond and comes back to life. He appears on the train at the end of the movie. He's just... Uh, a, a great kind of secretive character that really brings out the theme of the movie, uh, this, this voodoo mysterious theme. Next is Teehee, Dr. Kananga's main henchman. He has a claw for an arm. Do I need to say anything else? He's pretty cool. He smiles a lot. He has these little sunglasses. He even follows James Bond onto the train to kill him, even after Dr. Kananga's gone. Uh, it's like he just wants to get back at James Bond, and he's a great villain. Uh, I think he's a great compliment to Kananga, and uh, he... I'll tell you what, Ian Fleming really had a good idea when he came up with this character. Just a great henchman. I'd like to talk about, just really quick, this guy Whisper. The, the, this, like, fat, afro, really quiet henchman guy. I mean... He, he's just like an all-purpose. He does everything for Kananga. He, like, kills James Bond's driver in the beginning of the film. He, like, carries bodies. He just kind of sits there, and he's just a presence in the movie, but definitely needed and definitely enjoyed. Finally, uh, one thing about this movie I did not like is the recurrence of, quote, Quarrel Jr., or quarrel as he actually was in the Ian Fleming novel. Uh, what I really had a problem with the screenwriters uh, about this is, is this. 
First of all, Live and Let Die was written before Dr. No in the Ian Fleming novels. That's why Quarrel Jr. was able to be in both books. However, in the films, I don't understand why they couldn't just make Live and Let Die a prequel to Dr. No and have the same actor play Quarrel. Just Quarrel. Not Quarrel Jr., just Quarrel. I didn't really like how they reintroduced him with Rosie and how he was kind of... It, it was just a bad attempt. But he's a nice guy, so what you gonna do? A final word on this movie. This is by far now my favorite James Bond movie, and to be honest, probably my favorite even after I saw, even after I see these new James Bond movies that I'm about to review, which I know you'll enjoy, just like my fellow video boys. Um, I loved the theme song. Live and Let Die. It was one of my favorite, if not my favorite part about this movie in terms of the aspects and the feel of the movie. Uh, it's a great song by Paul McCartney. It can be enjoyed. Trust me, I play it in my car all the time, both in the movie and outside of the movie. It has a great beat. It occurs tons throughout this movie. I mean, sometimes they play it where they might not even need to, but... My opinion is, I love it. Great song. Last thought about this movie, it, it's just a great movie, great plot, great characters. Go out and see it. Tell me what you think in the comments below. Thanks for watching. And uh, you guys, you know, you know they say, live and let live. You know they, you know they did. You know they did. You know they did. But just live and let die.